In this video, I show how I created an industrial control system to accurately control the temperature in this wind tunnel. Using Ignition, I got a modern system that can be used on both smartphones and computers. I used only cheap electronics, so this is something you can easily try out for yourself. Let's get started. When I started this project, I knew that I wanted to control the wind tunnel using this Wemos D1 mini board, because it is cheap, it's easy to program, and it has Wi-Fi built in. But except that, I didn't really know what I wanted from this project. So I started to set up two requirements. Number one was that I wanted to control the temperature with good precision. In the wind tunnel, the air is heated by a heating element in the end of the pipe. The temperature of the air is then measured by a sensor, and based on that, we know how much power we need to send to the heating element. This is very similar to the convection oven you have on your kitchen. It works by turning the power on when the temperature is low, and when the temperature reaches a limit, the power is turned off. This works nice, but the disadvantage of this method is that the temperature will not be very stable. So this type of on-off control will not be good enough for our project. That's why we will control the temperature using a PID controller. I actually ended up creating my own PID controller library for Arduino that you can find on GitHub, and we will get back to this PID controller later in the video. The second project requirement was that I wanted the control system to have a functional and good looking user interface. I also wanted it to be web based. The purpose of the user interface was to give the user a quick overview over the process and also to let the user do actions like setting the temperature set point and fine tuning the PID controller. The tool I ended up using was Ignition Maker Edition from Inductive Automation. I ended up using this because it is free for makers, it has a good connectivity and it is web based. With that in place, it was then time to think about how things were going to communicate. The air heater device had a pretty simple interface with an analog voltage from 0 to 5 volts to control how much power is used to heat the air. The temperature sensor reading was the output and it was also in the format of 0 to 5 volts. The Wemos D1 mini microcontroller can read this temperature directly because it has one analog input pin. However, it does not have an analog output pin, so we have to use PVM. With PVM output, you can only have 0 or 5 volt as the output voltage, but using a filter, you can get an analog voltage from this, and this is fed back into the air heater. The PID controller will run inside the microcontroller. So what we have here is the complete control loop, and we haven't even added the user interface. And I think that's a good design decision to make uh, this control loop function on its own, because uh, then we will not have any problems if the network connection is down later. We can then add the ignition server, which will be a service running on a computer. I chose Modbus TCP as the protocol for transferring data, because it is light and simple. As a user, the only thing you have to do to use the system is to open the browser on your phone and enter the IP address of the ignition server and then you have the control system in front of you. For fun, I added data logging to the ThingSpeak cloud service. This is also free for hobbyists, and it's the only part of the project that needs an internet connection. A little trick I did while developing this project was to create a simulation of the air heater device. Using this, I had a virtual version of the air heater inside the microcontroller, and because of that, I didn't have to connect any wires. And I also didn't have to listen to that noisy sound or deal with starting up and shutting down the system all the time. This simulation could be made pretty simple. I first defined a variable t in the code which represented the simulated temperature. I then found an expression that told me how much the variable t should change every second. This is actually called a differential equation. I then took the temperature change and added it to the variable t every second. This way, the t variable started moving according to the differential equation. Now, let's have a look at what the microcontroller code does. A lot of things have to be checked every program loop, and the first thing it does is to check if the Wi-Fi is connected. The board is programmed to connect to a Wi-Fi hotspot, and if it sees that it is not connected, it tries to reconnect. When Modbus is handled, 
the processor must respond to either write or read requests from the outside world. The requests can only interact with a set of 16-bit values, called holding registers. This is often defined as an array in the code, and it's here we will put the values we want to transfer. The values in my code is usually of the data type float. One problem that occurs here is that the float variable type uses 32-bit for storing its value under the hood. And in a normal holding register, there's only 16-bit. Because of that, we need to use two holding registers to store this value. And we do it this way with all the variables. To confirm that this works, you can open a Modbus testing program like BV Modbus client that I have programmed myself. And you can set the data type to float and see that you recognize the values from the microcontroller. When handling the PID controller, the code runs the library pidbv for Arduino. And this works like a normal PID controller that calculates our controller output based on the actual value and previous values. I have posted the library on GitHub. The simulation of the air heater process works as described before, but it will be replaced with the physical inputs and outputs later. Because the measured temperature may be a noisy signal, a filter is applied to remove the largest peaks. This data is fed back into the PID controller in the next iteration. Finally, a part of the code uses the ThingSpeak library to write data to the ThingSpeak cloud. That's all there is to the microcontroller program. You will find a link to it in the description if you want to take a look at it for yourself. Now let's take a look at the user interface part using Ignition. After downloading and installing Ignition Maker Edition on my computer, I got access to the ignition settings in the web interface. On this page, you can configure almost any aspect of ignition, but what I did was to add a connection to my Modbus device. To do this, I navigated to Config, OPC UA, and Device Connections. On this page, I added a new device and found the type Modbus TCP. I added the device, added my IP address and the correct port, and also adjusted some special settings like reverse word order and zero based addressing. Then I was ready to go. From the web interface, I then downloaded the Ignition Designer tool, which I downloaded, installed, and connected it back to the Ignition Gateway. I could then log in, choose or create a new project, and get the designer up and running. To see Modbus values in the designer, I had to add an OPC tag, and in the OPC item path, I had to add the device name of the Modbus device and HRF0 to get the first floating point number. When saving this, I got a new tag in my tag browser, and it was receiving the correct value. I could then add ignition views that displays the created tags on the screen. First, I created the main window, that shows an overview over how the system works. I also created another view that included trend lines from the system. The two created views were then combined into one view by inserting them into another view. They were put into a column container, which allowed them to move around depending on how wide the screen is. This allows us to create a responsive design. We can see that it works correctly when we open the browser and slowly narrow it in. When it hits the breakpoint, the layout changes. It also shows up correctly when viewing it on a smartphone. As you see here, I made a custom pop-up used to tune the PID controller. On the front page, it shows the set point and the actual temperature. And you can also see what the controller outputs. On the parameter page, you can adjust the values of the P, I, and D parameters. To the right, we can see the simulated process, and we see that it is not stable. This is because the PID controller does not have good parameters. To try to find better parameters, we can start by setting the derivative time to zero and set the integral time to a very high value. We can then test different P gains and lower it enough to stop the oscillating behavior. I managed to find some good working controller gains, and as you see, the process responds good after a change in setpoint. 
at this point, I felt happy about how everything worked, so I started to prepare for the test on the real process. To do that, I had to make this circuit to convert from PVM to an analog voltage. Because my microcontroller only runs on 3.3 volts, I also had to make conversions between 3.3 volts and 5 volts. The easiest part here was to scale down the input voltage to 3.3 volts, because the only thing you need is a voltage divider. On the output side, I had to increase the voltage on the PVM. For that, I used a 9 volt battery and a transistor. I then passed that signal into a normal low pass filter and got an analog voltage in the end. The output voltage was later confirmed to be pretty linear and had a maximum voltage of 7.3 volts. I also wanted to check that I had a smooth output voltage and that I did not have any parts of the PVM base frequency left. It was clear that the filter had a strong effect and it was almost too strong because you can see that the filter prevents the output voltage from changing instantly. Now it was time to test the complete system using the physical air heater process. The process was easy to hook up because it uses the common banana plugs. I hooked up my two wires for the two analog signals and a ground wire. I then powered up my microcontroller circuit using a power bank and waited for the values to show up in ignition. When they did, I checked that the heating element worked by setting a high setpoint value and checking that the heating lamp was blinking. I also could feel the heat with my hand. As expected, the PID parameters used on the simulated process did not work well on the physical process. The P and I parameters were tuned manually by trial and error, and after a while I got some values I was happy with. As you see on the trend lines, the process now responds good after a step change in the setpoint. I just moved the setpoint down to 38 degrees, and the heating element has now stopped heating completely to allow the temperature to fall down. Now it's getting closer and the heating element starts carefully to heat. It will settle around the heating power where it finds the equilibrium. We will give it some time to settle. I see some small variations on the signal here and it may be due to a poorly tuned controller or maybe some noise existing in the system. Anyway, I decided that the stability was good enough so I concluded that the project was successfully completed. Now I have a few words about cybersecurity to see if the system fulfills the security triangle. The availability part states that the information should be available to the correct people. We have already logging of the values in the database inside Ignition, so the values are available, but we could add a password protection. We could also add a better system to make it easier for the user to get data out of the system. We should also think about what happens when the data storage is full. When considering the data integrity, we want to know if the data can be trusted. To trust the data, we need to know that we are connected to the correct ignition server and not the server set up by a hacker. To ensure this, we could use an HTTPS connection through our web browser and use a signed SSL certificate so we can know that the server is what it says it is. Another point here is that the analog voltage we are measuring should have sufficiently high accuracy to ensure that the data is really useful later. To make sure the confidentiality is in place, we should of course protect the data by a password protection, but we must also consider how the data is transferred. Since Modbus was used here, the data is actually transferred in clear text and could potentially be read by someone else inside the network. Luckily, we are using a closed network here, and the wireless network is password protected and encrypted, so that protects us from anyone in the outside world. If this data is sent to the cloud, it should be sent over a VPN tunnel. My conclusion after this project is that I really like how Ignition allows you to draw beautiful images on the server and lets you open the pictures on, for example, a smartphone. I also think it's great that it supports a lot of different protocols. Inside the microcontroller, 
Both the PID controller and the simulated process worked perfectly. I also think it was very convenient to use uh, Modbus TCP for the communication because it's easy to use an array of holding registers on a microcontroller. The logging to ThingSpeak was also a success and gives you access to the data from anywhere in the world. That's it for this video. Thank you.